Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming. My name is Steve Dewey. I'm the director of the Washington, D.C. chapter of the Bastia Society. Our sponsor is the American Institute for Economic Research, otherwise known as AIER. The purpose of the Bastia Society is to educate and promote the ideals of free market economics and sound money, limited government, and personal liberty. If you would like to learn more about AIER and the Bastia Society, our website address is AIER.org. Today I'm very honored and excited to have a real expert on the intelligence agencies, Dr. Michael Waller is our featured speaker. He will be speaking on a book he had published late last year entitled Big Intel, How the CIA and FBI Went from Cold War Heroes to Deep State Villains. During the Cold War, America's intelligence agencies, particularly the CIA and the FBI, were revered and trusted by the American public to protect the nation from its enemies, both foreign and domestic. However, in recent years, these agencies have become increasingly politicized and transformed into a police state apparatus against its own citizens. Dr. Waller will discuss this new threat to our constitutional liberties and how to address it as he has explained in his book. A brief summary of our speaker's background, Michael Waller is the Senior Analyst for Strategy at the Center for, Pul for Security Policy and also President of Georgetown Research. His academic and professional focus has been in the areas of strategic influence, public diplomacy, political and psychological warfare, foreign propaganda, and other related areas. Dr. Waller uh, previously served as the Walter and Leonore Annenberg Chair in, the, in International Communications at the Institute for World Politics for 13 years. He was a founding editor of, and I'm not sure I know how to pronounce this, Democratize, Democratizia, <laughs> close enough, the Journal of Post-Soviet Democratization published in cooperation with the American University and Moscow State University and Defense Strategic Communications published by NATO. Dr. Waller has been an instructor with the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California and the John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center and School at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. He has guest lectured at the FBI Academy, the George C. Marshall Center, the Marine Corps University, the National Defense University, and the National Intelligence University. He has also served as a staff member of the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate, and as a, con as a consultant to the U.S. Information Agency, the U.S. Agency for International De Development, the U.S. Army, and the Office of the U.S. Secretary of Defense. He has published numerous, he has been published in numerous periodicals and the major print media, including Forbes, the New York Post, the New York Times, USA Today, the Washington Times, the Wall Street Journal, and many others. <clears throat> He's also, he also authorized a prize-winning book in 1994 entitled Secret Empire, <clears throat> the KGB in Russia Today, which predicted the rise of a Russian gangster state dominated by the old KGB. Michael Waller earned his PhD in International Security Affairs and his MA degree in International Relations and Communications from Boston University and his BA degree in International Affairs from the George Washington University. Dr. Waller will speak for roughly 45 minutes, which will leave us roughly 15 minutes for a Q&A session for Dr. Waller to answer a few questions from our attendees. So now I will turn it over to Michael Waller. Michael. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks for coming, everybody. It was great to, uh, it's great to be here. Also, as, as a Leadership Institute grad from <coughs> when I was a, a skinny kid long ago. Um, the real threat that our, our national security apparatus presents you know, could be its size, could be its lawlessness, could be its partisan abuses, uh, as many would, would rightly argue, but more, those things can be fixed. 
What really can't be fixed, or at least can't be fixed very easily, is the ideological capture of these institutions. Is the ideological capture of these institutions that rejects American founding principles. So it's one thing to have a bureaucratic bias, which we've always had. It's, it's one thing to have uh, partisan abuses, which we've always had and managed to address uh, for better or for worse. But imagine when our institutions that are sworn with upholding our Constitution no longer believe in those founding principles on which the Constitution was based and view the Constitution as a living document that can be reinterpreted on a whim and where depriving people of their rights endowed by our Creator with the Bill of Rights can be randomly deprived without due process. So we've come to the point now in our nation's history that you have the capture of, of, of a worldview that's alien to our founding, hostile to our founding, and based on political theory that postdates our founding, it comes as an import from Central Europe. So if you go back and look, and this was kind of a surprise, because in setting out to write the book Big Intel about how the CIA and FBI went from Cold War heroes to deep state villains, it was supposed to be about what happened in the FBI and CIA under Obama, how did it continue under Trump, and then how did it, how is it today under Biden? That was the intention of it. But in doing this, I came across what Diana West calls the red thread. And you keep pulling on that red thread, and you keep finding where it takes you. And it takes you to a meeting in 1922. So this is a century old issue at the Marx Engels Institute in Moscow. This was less than five years after the Bolshevik Revolution, nearly five years. And it was attended by the leaders of the Comintern, the heads of the European Communist parties, which is how we know that the meetings took place, and by Felix Jusinski, head of the Cheka, which was the forerunner of the KGB. And at that meeting, it was discussed, you know, how are we going to spread our revolution now? The World War I has, you know, has been over for a few years. Weimar Germany is ripping itself apart. What can we do to accelerate the process of revolution in the Western countries when those countries really aren't going to be fertile ground for a violent Bolshevik-style revolution? So the idea was to set up shop in Germany and tear out the political center of Germany, rip out the cultural center of Germany, polarize the country, make the whole, the whole nation collapse, make Germans to stop believing in their country, in their sense of nation, in their regional identities, in their religion, in their traditions, in their values, and just tear the place apart, and then the communists can come in and just take over. Well, the Nazis beat them to it. And quite literally, the school that was set up at Goethe University at Frankfurt, Germany, so called the Frankfurt School, literally facilitated the rise of Adolf Hitler by helping collapse Weimar Germany. So where did these Frankfurt School people go right after Hitler took power? They went to Switzerland, they went to France, they went to the United Kingdom, and they also came here. And they set up shop with the help of a Soviet intelligence agent at Columbia University, where they came with Herbert Marcuse was one of them, Theodore Adorno was one of them, and the others, and they, they set up the entire program at Columbia that developed critical theory into what we know today. And then out of that came critical law theory, which was now taught at the law schools, and it's taught at almost every law school in America. Critical meaning 
you criticize relentlessly everything for the purpose of destroying it and weaponizing it to suit your revolutionary purpose. So then after critical law theory came critical race theory, critical gender theory, and all the other different critical theories. So imagine then you have mills of law schools churning out lawyers who are mostly unemployable in the private sector because they provide no value as critical theorists. Literally, they, they, what do they do? They provide no value unless a false demand is created for diversity, equity, and inclusion standards and litigation to that effect and laws to that effect. Then they suddenly have value. So when a lot of people who, like lawyers especially, who don't really provide value in the private sector, they gravitate toward government service. Not to be critical of all lawyers in government service, but certainly a lot of them. So you have these you know, Justice Department, which you can see the bias just in the FEC reporting, you know, 95 to 97 percent of Justice Department employees give to Democrats routinely. Uh, one of the more conservative, one of the most conservative, in quotes, agencies is the State Department in terms of its giving. Phil's having a good chuckle at that. <laughs> Maybe you gave one big donation, I don't know, but it was, <laughs> it was, um, so, so you see, so the, the, the one agency that's charged with enforcing our laws and um, is the one that's the most highly politicized that doesn't come anywhere near representing the American mainstream. Neither does state for that matter or any of the other agencies, but especially we're talking about state because that is the, what Jerzynski would have called the sword and shield of our government, of our internal security, of our justice system. Those are the ones who can come after you with the guns. Predominantly, there are others who can too. So, so imagine an army of lawyers steeped in critical theory for decades now, coming from our law schools, going into DOJ and elsewhere, and then telling the FBI what to do, and then populating the FBI and populating these other agencies. So it's, it's not a stretch at all to say this because so many of the critical theorists themselves and critical law theorists themselves have said how influential the Frankfurt School has been to inventing the field of critical law theory and then to populating our legal system with critical law attorneys and prosecutors and FBI agents and so forth and judges. So in a nutshell, then, you can see and you trace the genealogy back, you can trace it literally back year by year, institution to institution, person to person. So you have an unbroken ideological chain of custody since that 1922 meeting in Moscow with Felix Jasinski and the Comintern. So this is a century-old Soviet active measure campaign, not just an operation, that outlasted the Soviet Union. Indeed, at that meeting, they said, this will outlast our lifetimes. They were looking at this in multi-generational terms, and they were correct in, in you know, looking back over 100 years. So what we find then is that our foreign intelligence community, whose duty was and is to protect the United States against foreign ideological threats, and the FBI, which by statute has the duty to defend the nation and to disrupt and expose and neutralize foreign propaganda threats and ideological threats, completely failed in their missions. And not only did they fail, they completely absorbed those ideological threats that they were sworn to defend against. So this didn't happen overnight. It wasn't just Obama coming in and naming Eric Holder and a few other radicals uh, to uh, James Comey and others. Although if you look, Holder went to Columbia University. He participated in the, the um, foreign-inspired riots of the uh, late 60s, early 70s. He continues to defend it. He was part of the group that took a dean hostage and he doesn't, you know, unlike um, John Brennan, former CIA director who, who 
dismissed his vote for Gus Hall and the Soviet-backed Communist Party as a youthful indiscretion or as a lark. And then a few years later, he got hired straight into the CIA. Uh, Brennan dismisses that. Holder is really honest when he says, no, I'm standing by it. And he actually speaks about it publicly. He's very frank about it. So you have these, these individuals who, you know, he becomes Attorney General of the United States being unrepentant about taking the Dean hostage in a Cuban-inspired riot at Columbia University during the Vietnam War, which by extension was also in solidarity with Hanoi. So, so it's not unusual then for groups of people who with these uh, youthful backgrounds, with these uh, education backgrounds, some of them to borrow into the system, who gave Eric Holder his first political appointment, Ronald Reagan. Holder did go after Democrats, corrupt Democrats, but he was one of those who borrowed into the system what, they, what Trotsky called boring from within. And he, didn't, he meant boring like drilling from within. This is what people like Holder were doing. Now, we don't know the real loyalties of them. They might or might not be conscious of the fact that their ideology was sponsored by and pushed by the intelligence services of the Soviet bloc. They might just sincerely believe it, but that doesn't matter. The fact is that the ideologies have permeated the very people at the very top of our system who came in through the bottom of the system. So that was Holder, who's what, he's in his 70s now. Think of the people 20 years younger than him who are now at the senior levels in the SES system of the country. They're part of the permanent bureaucracy. Think of the people they, they recruit, that they train, that they promote. And when you consider that the promotion system within the FBI, within the CIA, and the rest of the intelligence community is partially based on critical theory. So if you are not an active proponent, or what they call ally, of DEI and everything that means, you will not be promoted. And it's not a question of just going along to get along to be professional about it. Well, times are changing, I'm just gonna keep my head down, I'm just going to, to be quiet and, and meekly comply. That's not good enough anymore. That's not being an ally. So what has been done in our intelligence community and federal law enforcement is to turn every agent of force, whether it's physical coercion or legal coercion, or spying domestically or abroad, turn them into agents of influence for this foreign ideology. They must do it if they seek to get promotion. And in the FBI, if you're not promoted within 18 months, you're not gonna be staying there. So the careerists are going to wanna go along to get along with their just doing my job mentality. So you can see where this risk's going, or it's really, it's really begun already. No one in the Bureau has taken this as a counterintelligence problem. In fact, the counterintelligence division of the FBI, as well as the public corruption division in the FBI, are two of the most rotten units in the whole Bureau in terms of ideology. And you could see this also, uh, it was known beforehand, but you could see it when somebody like Peter Strzok rose to the very top. He was our chief spy hunter. So it's not a question of a president coming in and just putting in a new FBI director or a new CIA director. And look at the CIA, say, under not just Brennan. Let's go to the Trump period. Mike Pompeo was brought in. Good man. I liked him. I understand why some people don't, but I thought he, I thought he was a fine secretary of state. But when he was CIA director, he was run like an op. He never had a political deputy appointed to help him out. He had Gina Haspel, who was uh, at our station in London, who was about as woke as you could want. 
And a lot of this wokeness comes out of MI6, by the way. So the, the, the liaison relationship that you, the U.S. has with MI6. If you just look at the, the tweets of the MI6 director, who's the only person in MI6 who can speak officially for, for the, the Secret Intelligence Service of the U.K., he, he, he predated the CIA in this wokeness and this extremism. So you can see how it was coming from, in this case, the UK. Uh, but with somebody like Gina Haspel as the liaison person, it became normal or it became appealing to her or whatever else. She's brought back to be Pompeo's deputy. And then what does she do? She sends him around the world on a tour of our different stations for the better part of a year. And he never had a grip on the CIA. He put it all in her hands. So you can see that even in a Trump administration, Trump put the CIA in charge of itself. And he put the strongest proponents of critical theory in charge of the CIA. So it wasn't under Biden that the, those, the, remember those CIA recruitment commercials with that admittedly mentally disturbed Latinx uh, cisgendered uh, woman with a grudge against everything? She gave that, you know, I am me, I am excellent, I am perfect, uh, I, am, I am fighting the patriarchy ad for the CIA, that was not a Biden era production. That was produced under the Trump administration and released under the Biden administration. So you can see that's, that's the most visible of many examples of how the CIA is going out of its way to recruit the crazies in our society as our intelligence officers and analysts. How do you fix this? Think of it, when Obama became president, think of the low-level people coming into the FBI and the CIA, straight out of college or law school or wherever else. They're mid-career professionals now. Many of them were artificially promoted on the grounds of DEI, and it wasn't because they were the best for the job. So they're the supervisors, they're the human resources departments, they're the adjudicators, they're the personnel evaluators, determining who rises up in these systems. And then they broke compartmentation in the CIA through DEI cell groups. They, they're called agency resource groups in the CIA, ARGs in the FBI and elsewhere. In the private sector, they're called employee resource groups or ERGs. And these are grievance-based, identity-based cell groups where rather than doing your job, you identify based on whatever grievance or gender identification or um, you know, racial identification or whatever else you have. And you talk about how to change your agencies and act as literally what the Office of Director of National Intelligence calls secret agents of change. This was under Obama, this was under Trump, this is under Biden. Secret, this is a crime. Our intelligence officers are not supposed to be change agents within our own country, but they are by their very own admission. So you can see when, when Obama was talking about fundamentally transforming America, he was dead serious. And he had ideologues like his attorney general, his FBI director, his CIA director, his ODNI, his DNI, Director of National Intelligence, and so many others pushing this. And then you think of the university pool th from which our agencies recruit now. You do have some really good places that are good feeder schools that are still being fed into the intelligence community, but those are few. Yesterday I was in Philadelphia at the uh, American Political Science Association. Um, don't ever go, don't ever bother. Uh, I, I was asked to speak, the Claremont Institute put on a panel, it's really just a, as a good eye poke into the uh, association. It's really an insane, it's crazy place. But this is a recruiting ground for the CIA and the FBI and every place else. And when I registered, they gave me my gender identity button which one would I like? So I picked they, them, and theirs, because uh, I put on about 30 pounds over the past year, so I thought, there's, there's two of us. And I, I told this to the, and they, they were appealed by that. That has nothing to do with gender. <laughs> What's 
really? So, so um, when you see the insanity that America's most prestigious political, in quotes, uh, political science scholarly organization with thousands of, many thousands of members, they're cranking out the faculty and the intelligence analysts and the investigators and everybody else to go. And, and you, you get credentialed by this. I mean, this was co-sponsored by Cambridge University Press, which is supposedly the most prestigious, it used to be, academic publisher on earth. So this is where our prestige has gone. Now, you try to have an honest discussion of critical theory and where it's gone. If it's critical theorists talking among themselves, they'll talk about their successes. They'll talk about how Herbert Marcuse was so important to giving the younger disorganized people of the new left a, a ideological discipline and training and a strategic vision to just go and do more than just plant a pipe bomb in, in some place or, or, you know, wear a Che Guevara t-shirt, but really to do something with purpose and how he was so influential in giving a strategic mission, he and a few others, and, make, and turning this into an academic discipline. But when, when, when you say it in public, you're people like us, you know, you're a liar, you're a conspiracy theorist, and so forth. So anyway, we had our little panel uh, at the Claremont Institute, and it was a wonderful panel, and you could tell, you could literally tell who was likely to attend the panel because they were wearing jackets and ties. No offense to those who don't, because I hate wearing jackets and ties. But I mean, you can see just by the atmospherics of the American Political Science Association, what kind of road to hell our country is going down with the so-called scholarship out there. So you want an honest assessment of critical theory, just listen to the critical theorists talking among themselves as long as they don't think you're listening. It's fascinating. So back to, back to, uh, Back to this problem that we have with our, with our uh, system, you can't fix it just by rearranging the org charts or switching out the leadership. You have right now at the CIA senior, very capable people, including station chiefs, punching out at age 50 because they're sick of it. And that's true in a bureaucracy anyway. It's very frustrating to be in one, but they're sick of this ideological orthodoxy. Same thing with the FBI. There are a few younger FBI agents who've gone very public and whistleblowers, and they've, they've done a great job. They've also got into a lot of fist fights that they shouldn't have gotten into with some friends on our side, but still, uh, they really shed light on a lot of the problem because a lot of the older FBI guys who've left still think, well, we can't hurt the Bureau. We can't say anything in public because the worst, that's part of the FBI's cultural ethos since J. Edgar Hoover's time. The worst crime you can commit in the FBI is to embarrass the Bureau, which is a real shame because the Bureau has turned into an embarrassment to be charitable about it. But if you just look at, we'll let the Bureau embarrass itself as an example. Go to at FBI jobs on Twitter X and look at the types of people they're recruiting. They want real professionals for science and technology. Everything else is DEI. Everything else is rainbow flag, gender, grievance, and, and careerism. Build your career at the FBI. We have so much you know, employee satisfaction. I mean, really, all the benefits the FBI is saying that it has, it's true for the whole civil service, but they're making themselves look really special. But they don't have much about how to serve your country how to defend against foreign spies. They don't have that in, at FBI jobs on Twitter X. You can see they're recruiting to take over. It's a, it's a takeover of these organizations from below, directed not by FBI Director Ray. He's just a Washington Beltway lawyer who's being run by the purple-haired crazies within the nervous system of the Bureau. And he's allowed that to happen. So, so you have a self-perpetuating bureaucracy within the Bureau that's using the structure. It's kind of like a hermit crab. It uses somebody else's structure as its, as its habitat. Same thing's happening with the CIA. 
So the people who used to say, abolish the FBI, why? Because the FBI was cracking down on Marxist radicals, are now the ones saying that if you don't support the FBI, you're a Russian tool. So, so where do we go then? There are a lot of options that a, that a president with a plan, president with a strategy, president coming into the White House with the executive orders written and the personnel teams and hit lists put together can do. First of all, the most, the most uh, sort of my favorite one, is that uh, the FBI likes to brag that it was founded in 1908, which it really wasn't, but it, it says that it was founded in 1908 as a Bureau of Investigation within the Justice Department. Um, with special agents who had certain authorities. Well, that, was a, that founding document of the FBI was an attorney general memorandum. No act of Congress founded the FBI. The FBI has no charter. It has no nothing like that. So if an attorney general can create the bureau, then a future attorney general can abolish the bureau. That doesn't mean to leave us without the necessary functions that the FBI has. But you can put the training over, take Quantico, put the training over with the marshals. Take the criminal branch of the FBI, hand it over to the marshals. The marshals were founded by who? George Washington. And in all that time, their scandals have been very few. People trust the marshals. Until such time as the marshals no longer deserve the public trust. They're going woke too, by the way, but not at the same speed as the FBI. So move, on, move the whole criminal investigation part and the training part over to the marshals, which are already involved in that kind of work. Why do we need ATF? Well, why do we need ATF is one, you know, New Deal progressive type thing. But why do we need ATF and a firearms and explosive unit in the FBI? So just move all the firearms and explosive people to ATF and then deal with ATF later on. Have a standing counterintelligence service the way Michelle Van Cleve had proposed and that President George W. Bush actually implemented, which was the National Counterintelligence Executive. Once she left, they put an FBI agent in charge and it really hasn't done its job its intended job, but if you revive that as a standing offensive strategic counterintelligence service, that's gonna be a plus for our country. But take, it, take the whole counterintelligence function out of the FBI also. What does that leave you with, or the Bureau with? Well, they've got a great science lab that, that is the envy of the world. Keep it, but let the marshals run it. And then take a stump grinder to the rest of the Bureau. We just don't need it. Now, so it just but as a reference point, there's a lot of bashing of J. Edgar Hoover, and he deserves his share of it. But when you think of his political abuses, he was doing it for whatever president was in power, whether it was Warren Harding or Franklin Roosevelt or John F. Kennedy or Lyndon Johnson or up to a certain point, Richard Nixon. He wasn't running his own political warfare campaigns for the Bureau. And in fact, he couldn't initiate most criminal investigations, neither could the Attorney General. They had to be done from any of our 56 field offices around the country and run by those originating offices and then brought up to the center where the special agent in charge in Cincinnati or Boston or Honolulu or wherever would, would have direct access to the director himself but now with the post 9-11 reforms, with the Bush centralization of everything, the field special agents in charge can't talk to the director very much anymore. It's now a 66, 60, 60 something person, giant SES bureaucracy at the top of the J. Edgar Hoover building, which they hate calling that by that name because uh, they find him an embarrassment. So then that rewards the careerism to get to the top of the ladder at the FBI. And, wh and what is the careerism motivated by? Part of that now is your quarterly fitness reports. One of the criteria is, are you sufficiently complying to be an advocate for everything relating to DEI? 
And if you're an agent who's not doing that, your special agent in charge is responsible. And if you don't check all those boxes every quarter and then, and then every year, the special agent in charge doesn't get his bonus. And some of the bonuses are in the tens of thousands of dollars a year. So you have a financial incentive for the special agents in charge and for the upper management at headquarters to be force feeding DEI on the whole FBI force. So how can you undo it? Easy. Just repeal the Obama executive orders that mandated this. Repeal the Biden executive orders reinforcing this. Um, transfer any FBI management to undesirable hardship posts who were responsible for any of this. Open up a field office in the Aleutian Islands. And if they don't go, they have to be forced out of government service. It's their choice. Nothing wrong with that. Neat thing about the intelligence community is they're not protected under civil service laws. So a president can remove any intelligence professional for any reason without cause. That's a great tool for us to have. Another tool, again, on the internal front back to the FBI is uh, FBI needs, needs the support of local state and local authorities, including sheriffs, to be their eyes and ears and often to be their hands to do the work in the state and local areas. But sheriffs are a different kind of cat. They don't have to cooperate with the FBI if they don't want to. They can't impede the FBI, but they can't let the FBI, they don't have to let them use local offices, local vehicles, local teams. They, can't, uh, they don't have to deputize FBI agents because the FBI can't enforce state laws. But they also can't operate in many cases locally unless they've been deputized by the local sheriff. So the local sheriffs can say, no, we're not going to deputize you because what you're doing is unjust. Some sheriffs are already doing that. But in any election year where sheriffs are up for popular vote to be elected, people need to know, is your local sheriff helping the central government unjustly go after your neighbors? Or is he looking out for the people who voted for the the sheriff. So that's an important thing to think of, and most people don't think of sheriffs in that way. In, in many parts of the country, the sheriffs don't have that much power. But in the Midwest and out West, they do. So that's another line of defense that we have. And, and um, let the public judge, do they want a woke sheriff or not? I think most people would not vote for one. So these are some of, the, some of the instruments that we do have to reverse this. Another one uh, is uh, which the uh, the Trump administration, it wasn't the administration actually, it was the NSA, and it was not about wokeness because the NSA is really super woke. If you look at their job recruiting and their diversity page on their website, it, it makes it look like you know, some, some Chinese government funded front group wrote it. But the NSA then, they need, they need Chinese linguists and they needed people in the, in the uh, Texas uh, university system as feeder schools to the NSA for both, you know, for engineering and cryptography and for uh, linguistic skills, but they had the problem with the Confucius Institutes. And a lot of these state-run, taxpayer-funded schools like to have the Confucius Institutes because they don't have to pay for them. So the NSA said, we're going to discredit you as a feeder school to our organization unless you get rid of them, and therefore diminish the value of the degree from that school. And then, and then make certain faculty and programs ineligible for grants, and then you won't have the talent scouts coming to those schools, and it'll be a, a black mark on the school. So that actually worked. And it was simply a letter that was written. So you can say, we're going to discredit any school from, you know, into, from federal service, meaning we, the federal government will not recognize diplomas from these schools because you're just pushing this woke un-American, Soviet-sponsored, cultural Marxist curriculum that's going to contaminate, further contaminate the public services of our country. These are things that can be done quite easily. So if you look at, say, what President Trump has proposed, he's been quiet about what he would do with the FBI, but he's publicly proposed abolishing the Department of Education, 
returning that power to the states for each state to decide what to do, and then providing he didn't specify but what would seem like uh, block grants or something equivalent for those states that cannot afford certain funding uh, to be able to take up the slack where they would have been dependent on federal funding for their, their education needs. Well, you can do the same thing with the Department of Justice, which was a post-Civil War invention anyway. It was not one of our founding government entities. But you could certainly do it with the FBI and other parts of the security apparatus that have, have uh, have with the Justice Department really abused their power. So my timer was on backwards, so I don't know how much time I was doing. Actually, we could probably go to the questions now. If you okay, but the point is, as, as terrible and bleak and awful as it looks, and it really is, and it's not just happening to us, it's happening to uh, most of our NATO allies, it's happening to Australia and New Zealand, it's happening in Latin America, and you can see it now uh, with Brazil. Uh, it's, it's, it's going to hit Japan soon, Satoshi. So, so, I mean, this is a cancer that's going worldwide, but you can see how just a few people, Chris Rufo, Robbie Starbuck, a couple of others, just with, the, with their very small organizations and their Twitter X accounts, have been forcing these companies to back down from pushing DEI. We can do the same thing with our... Uh, central government. So yeah, the enemy is within the gates, but we can still chew them up if we decide to. I hate to end my talks with good news points, but <laughs> some people like that. So yeah, open up for any questions or arguments. So you disagree with Tom Baker, the former assistant uh, director at the FBI? I'm not. I'm so the question was, do I disagree with Tom Baker, the former? Right. Right. So Tom Baker was a uh, career FBI man. He got his start under J. Edgar Hoover. The last five years of Hoover, spent his whole career in the bureau, and then stayed on as a contractor for a couple decades. So he has been probably the one man alive who has been a personal witness to everything since J. Edgar Hoover up to the present day, and he has an amazing network of former FBI agents as friends. He's got a great book called uh, The Fall of the FBI. But he argues the FBI can be saved, should be saved, and it just needs a good house cleaning and reorganization. Uh, he and I have talked a lot in person, and we've become friends. We don't agree on everything, but he, we agree on a whole lot. Yeah, so the question was, do I agree with him, with, with Tom Baker, that the intelligence community coming into the FBI that did the damage? That's a lot of it, because after 9-11, the FBI was turned from a federal investigative and law enforcement agency into a domestic intelligence agency with police powers, and that really did a lot of damage. That's one big part of it, but it's also the ideological penetration of just weaponizing law enforcement in addition to intelligence. Yeah, this, this gets into a whole different area now of the FBI tying in with big data and big social media and then having these big media companies hire senior FBI officials to be a special liaison relationship and then to do politically motivated censorship. So, so Tom Baker is really big on that. I agree with him completely. Our only real difference is what to do with the bureau. He thinks it can be salvaged, and I don't. But we, he still wrote a nice review of Big Intel, despite that disagreement. Hello, uh, my name is Spencer. I just want to thank you for being here today. Um, my question. Well, I just would like you to substantiate a little more the premise of the intel community being a Cold War hero. I mean, if you look at a lot of the tactics they're using now, the same ones were employed back then en masse domestically, um, mostly to the same ends. It's just directed towards patriots now. So something like Operation Mockingbird, where the CIA was infiltrated in every major media outlet at the time, sort of facilitating domestic propaganda. 
Uh, it seems like, to me at least, these bureaucracies in and of themselves, whether they're controlled by the left or the right, are the enemies of liberty. So I'd be curious of your response to that. Okay, well, that's a, it's a great question because it was part of our, our Claremont discussion yesterday where talking about how the CIA being an outgrowth of New Deal and progressivism where the, the trust everything to the government experts. Uh, th this is a, if you go, if you look at the context of the creation of the CIA, we needed a foreign intelligence service. Uh, we were in the, the atomic age and the nuclear age and we couldn't have, you know, warfare had to be done on the more sub rosa level because that's the way the Soviets were doing it anyway. And you needed something to implement the bipartisan strategy of containment. So you needed something like the CIA. Where it went bad, and it went bad from the start, was early operations like Mockingbird, which was to, uh, to recruit or otherwise co-opt American journalists to influence the American news media to influence how we think as people. And that would have, logically, cultural and political effects domestically on our entire country effects that would last for decades. That was illegal from the start, but no one ever sought to keep the CIA accountable. So if you look back at history, the CIA for its first uh, roughly 25 years was never subject to a legislative oversight hearing or the judicial branch of government oversight of any kind. It was a self-contained entity of its own where the bipartisan consensus was, well, these guys are the experts, just let them do their job. And then a lot of conservatives who were the biggest supporters of the CIA when it was being attacked because it was fighting communism, or so we had hoped, uh, were content to look the other way. So it's a real complicated question you have there. We need something like the CIA. We don't need it as big as it is. We don't, you know, it has 35,000 roughly employees, only about 1,500 of whom are clandestine service agents working abroad. Most of those are just in liaison relationships with other uh, governments, intelligence services, which is where we get most of our human foreign intelligence. I thought maybe 500 of them might be worth their weight as, as civil servants, uh, but in talking to a bunch of former station chiefs, recently retired ones, they say, take a zero off that 500. So we've got this multi-billion dollar agency with 50 guys? Then you think of the analytical waste and abuse and stupidity there where president after president has ignored CIA analysis because a lot of it's well, Clinton just didn't care. Reagan said, this is, this is just junk. I can read this in the Washington Post. Yeah, because it's being leaked to the Washington Post. But so, so you know, most presidents don't rely on the intelligence analyses because they're so milquetoast and so bottom line. And now we find that Brennan was offering cash incentives for CIA analysts who had concluded that COVID-19 originated at the Wuhan Institute of Virology as a man-made virus. They were given cash incentives to change their analytical conclusions to being inconclusive. So you have then a corruption of the analytical process as well. I think we could have a good intelligence agency, foreign intelligence on a shoestring like the French do, very small, uh, sort of the uh, less is more. And we certainly don't need an intelligence ap apparatus to spy on the climate or to spy on gender and especially to spy on American citizens. So to get to your point to Mockingbird, there are, are extenuating circumstances, like I think the Cold War hero part, I think it was a brilliant, wonderful thing for us to have intervened in the 1948 elections of Italy to prevent it from going Stalinist. I think it was great to overthrow Mossadegh in Iran because he was going to turn Iran over to Stalin. Uh, it, it, was a, it was a wonderful uh, operation in our, against Arbenz in Guatemala for the same reason. I have no problem with CIA intervening against communists and Soviet proxies in a way that didn't put American forces in danger. Uh, it's just that they've gotten such a bad rap from the Marxists that a lot of conservatives are now saying what a terrible crime these things were. When I think they were a good thing because they allowed us to, to, to fight without fighting problem was things like Vietnam, which was a presidential decision, not a CIA decision. I could go on forever, as you can tell, but thanks for your question, Spencer.
Great presentation, uh, Dr. Waller. Question regarding, from the historical perspective, what seems to be inevitable uh, conclusion that the FBI failed in the late 1960s and the early 1970s to protect the country against the weathermen and all the other extremists, that they were incapable of doing the kind of police and intelligence work to shut down that threat. And that if we were to face another threat like that, an enemy who kept themselves offline, we might face again a, a real threat to national security. How do you assess the FBI's performance in the late 1960s, early 70s, before they were woke, before when they were in fact working for Jager Hoover? Well, you know, anyone who's heads an agency for decades is gonna get a bit long in the tooth. And so Hoover stayed on way too long. The thing is, when the Kennedys were discussing, sh should we fire him or not? And one of them said to the other, you can't fire God. But then they decided they needed Hoover. So they, they got, he, when he reached mandatory retirement age, it was 62 or 65 or whatever, they had him stay on as director, even though they hated him. Johnson kept him on because they'd been neighbors since he was, you know, since Johnson was a senator. They'd been neighbors and, you know, friends for all that time. So Johnson needed him, and plus they were both dirty tricksters. And then Nixon, who had had his political career as a congressman built up by J. Edgar Hoover, who was leaking to him um, when, when Nixon was on the House Committee on Un-American Activities, as he's president now, he's at loggerheads with Hoover because he realized the guy's been in too long. The FBI has atrophied. Hoover's looking at everything through the Stalinist Communist Party lens and not through the new left, Nixon didn't say, but Marcusean, um, uh, Frankfurt School kind of lens. So, they, so Hoover was never able to penetrate uh, the new left to the extent that it was useful and there was a legitimate reason for it, which was COINTELPRO. Everybody likes to bash COINTELPRO, the counterintelligence program that Eisenhower started. But it was really what it said it was. It was a counterintelligence program. So when they went after the, uh, the, the uh, Puerto Rican separatists, it was because there was a, now in the Kennedy Times, a Cuban backed dimension to it. They, Cubans were running Puerto Rican extremists. When it came down to monitoring Martin Luther King Jr., it wasn't to monitor him, it was to monitor Stanley Levison and the other Communist Party people around him who were bona fide Soviet agents, some of them going back to the common turn. And King was warned about this. And King said, okay, I'll keep them away. Well, it wasn't Hoover who bugged King, it was Bobby Kennedy who ordered the FBI to do it. But that was a legitimate counterintelligence function but one of the top FBI people really did some messed up stuff as part of that, which was extremely harmful to, in, with the letter encouraging King to commit suicide. But that had a legitimate function. So there were six COINTELPRO programs, seven of them, six of which were legitimate because they were all connected to foreign intelligence services manipulating our internal uh, polarization and problems. This was in the 50s and 60s. The seventh one was called Operation White Hate which was to infiltrate and disrupt the Ku Klux Klan. And as noble a goal as that was, it had no legitimate counterintelligence purpose because the Klan was not being exploited at the time by the Soviets or by any other foreign power. But, it, but, but that became part of COINTELPRO also. So Hoover just didn't, wasn't able to change with the times and the way he ran the bureau, you know, they were still using manual typewriters into the late 1970s. They didn't have any real good computing until after 9-11. Uh, the person who wrote their first accounting software was a man named Robert Hansen. So, so you know, the FBI still to this day has not really kept up with things, maybe thankfully so. So, so, so Hoover was never able to marshal the counterintelligence capabilities to go after the Soviet origins of critical theorists and who was Who's embracing it? Okay, it's a constitutional right to believe in something, but it's not a constitutional right to be a foreign agent. 
And, and so he was never able to be flexible enough. And also he didn't allow FBI agents to have long hair and grow beards and do hippie kind of things and, and, and look like communists, so look like modern day communists. So he wasn't able to, to have the Bureau fit in there either. But now the Bureau is very capable of those things, but they're not going after Cubans, they're going after people like you and me. Thank you. Um, another question for you. Um, many people characterize what we're up against as the swamp. Um, I think this may be pedantic or semantical, but I prefer to call it the Hydra because I think of it as a living entity that will fight back. Um, knowing that these intelligence agencies, if we were trying to counteract their power, would surely fight back. What are some of those countermeasures that you'd anticipate them using to some of the tactics you listed out? Oh, there's nothing they won't stoop to. I mean, let's look right now. First, there's a lot we don't know. So before we draw too many conclusions, let's just look at information out there. Um, this recent bust of a, of a Russian government-sponsored entity with two people from RT, Putin's media outlet, who are now alleged in, and in an indictment to have funded conservative pro-Trump um, influencers. You know, first, we shouldn't be shocked at that because that's what any good foreign intelligence would and should do to us just as we would and should be doing it to, to our adversaries. So it's no surprise that people would be targeted, and it's not just left-wingers who are being targeted, it's, it's everybody who's being targeted. So that's no surprise. Significantly, that indictment termed all of the influencers who were, who were pro-Trump people as innocent victims or as being deceived. I think deceived was the word that was being used. So they're not holding them um, account, you know, criminally accountable. But why would they release that in September of 2024? Why would they raid the home of Dmitry Symes in August 2024? For those of you who are uh, fortunate enough to have not, either not known or have forgotten about Dmitry Symes. He was a Soviet emigre who came here in the early 70s. He was a proponent of detente. He became a big time academic, uh, so-called wise, uh, wise man looking into Soviet and Russian affairs. Richard Nixon ended up liking him, brought him in to run the Nixon Center. He threw Nixon under the bus by getting him humiliated on his trip to Russia just before he passed away, and then renamed the Nixon Center his Center for the National Interest. Um, Dmitry Symes, um, his father was Konstantin Simis, who was a great anti-communist, as was his mother, uh, and they were persecuted by the Soviets for defending human rights victims in Russia. Uh, he left to come to the United States prior to their, their um, persecution themselves. They came here. Uh, the father wrote a book called uh, USSR, The Corrupt Society. Dmitry Symes transliterated his name differently so he wouldn't be associated with his anti-communist father. Symes as opposed to Simis. And then uh, always had a beef against anti-communists and people who were anti-KGB Americans. So he was a big power geopolitical guy. Anyway, bottom line is, even his father warned people, this was in the 80s, that his son was working for the KGB. What happens? He borrows into mainly Republican and center left and sort of McCainite, Bush, CSIS, uniparty establishment places, as, as his wife did, as professors teaching a whole lot of people. Anyway, the FBI raided his home in Virginia, Rappahannock area, um, last month. Why last month? It's been 40 years since he's been on the radar. Why last month? He hasn't been in the United States for the past two and a half years. Why? Because he's working for Russian state media that's been sanctioned by the United States. But they left him alone for over two years until why? Now, why? Because 
back, as any operative would and should do in going after an adversary. He infiltrated the Trump campaign, wrote Trump's first foreign policy speech that Trump gave in Washington. He helped write that, and he was an advisor back in 2016. So now you get your headline, former Trump advisor busted with Russia connection. Of course, you have to say alleged in all of these things, because, but, but, but the, the point is, Well, now I've, got, I've gotten off the question, Spencer, but it, it, it's, it, it, there's, there's a lot here. It, the, then you have other minor, oh, they got, they, so the, the indictment about Symes is what? Working for Russian sanctioned media. Well, great, but so what? He's been a, solidly alleged for, for decades to be a KGB asset, and the FBI has let him go. Why now? And then why this bottom of the barrel? Oh, oh, and then the FBI had a press release the other day. We have seized 32 internet domain names used to sway the election. Really, that's, that's a headline? No, that, that's not even a training exercise for a, for a, for a grad student. It, it's, it's nothing. But they're making it into a big deal, I think, to take real incidents and stretching other incidents to turn them into a narrative to bring the Russian collusion narrative back into the headlines. While um, Justice is good, and, and, and FBI field office, especially in New York, are going after Chinese agents, and they're doing a really good job of it in New York, but you don't see anything coming out from headquarters to any significant thematic degree about the Chinese uh, threat to our system. Need to wrap it up, but thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, great. This has been fun. Thank you.